we have as our speaker today Steve Yock, and Steve is an attorney with Fellhaber Larson, where he represents small and medium-sized firms in transactional matters and in court. A highly rated speaker, Steve has taught and written extensively on legal issues. His new book, Becoming George Washington, was selected as a fall read by the Pioneer Press and has received extensive positive coverage in print and broadcast media. Steve grew up in Minnesota, received his undergraduate degree from Boston College and came home to the University of Minnesota Law School. Most importantly to me, in terms of Steve's educational credentials, oh, yeah. he is a member of the Brecht School class of 1983 and I of 88. So, <laughs> Steve and his wife Andrea have two wonderful teen teenaged boys. Please join me in welcoming Steve Young. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna try to stand in the middle of the room. I, as you'll see, I'm kind of high energy and I have a big voice. But if you can't hear me, raise your hand and I'll go be trapped over there. Okay, so first of all, it's great to have Andrew introduce me. Uh, you would note that she managed to tell everybody that she's five years younger than me. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I love interactions and we'll, I'm sensitive to time. Mary will stand when I have to be done, so we'll end on time. But I love questions at the end, but I'm gonna ask you questions first, okay? And the good news is, is that nobody, half the people get these wrong. And um, I'm gonna answer whether they're true or false at the end so the people around you won't probably remember. And um, at the end of the day, if you don't raise your hand, you're answering anyway. Okay, so first of all, did George Washington have wooden teeth? Raise your hand if you think he had wooden teeth. Did he have wooden teeth? Did George have wooden teeth? Not many, okay, how about a wig? Did George Washington wear a wig? Raise your hand if you think he wore a wig. Mm, most wig people. And finally is the, I cannot tell a lie, chop down the cherry tree, is that true? Raise your hand. Wow, okay, I got none of those. All right, you're a tough crowd, okay. So, so the, 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 thing, the thing you just heard is, all right, I'm a Minnesota boy. By the way, Yach is German, we came in the 1840s. I got no connection with George Washington. I went to school here in, at Breck. Why do I write a book about George Washington, right? I mean, why? Um, as I got older, by the way, I love my job. I, I love being a lawyer. This is my hobby. It's become a fun hobby. Why him? And as, as I studied history and learned more about it, I realized that he is extremely unique. In fact, in history, there's few people that have given up power like he did. He could have been king twice. I think the most important day in American history is not July 4th, 1776, the day of the Declaration of Independence. I think it's actually this day, the day on here, the painting, when he returned his commission to Congress on December 23rd, 1783. Okay, at the end of the Revolution, we win, yay. And he goes to Maryland and hands his commission back and he goes home for seven years. It electrified the world. In fact, George III of England heard it, he thought it was a joke, and he said, well, if he did that, he's the greatest man in history, right? And the amazing thing, he really meant it. Um, and then he became president, and by the way, it's fair to say he really didn't want to be president. Um, and he had people like Alexander Hamilton whispering in his ear, and he did it again. He went back to Mount Vernon again. And, and I wanted to know why. And it led me to this guy. I love this because this is not a painting. So this is actually what George Washington looked like. If you go to Mount Vernon, you can see this. This is a full-size facial reconstruction of Washington. They took his death mask when he died, and they had his teeth, which I'll talk about later. And they regressed him to age 65 while president, 45 while leading the army. And this is George at 19. By the way, George Washington, I used to be 5'9", now I'm 5'8". Um, George Washington was 6'9", by modern standards. So think of a guy who's this tall, okay, walking around, because he was 6'3", and we've all grown six inches since then. So he was a huge, honking, really good-looking boy. And this is George dressed as a surveyor, um, which was his first job. So, okay, so how and why ultimately does he become who he becomes? Well, he really becomes this guy, George Washington, action hero. In fact. The first title of my book was George Washington Action Hero. Um, my publisher did not like that title. They said it was too Marvel Comics. Um, but as you'll hear, he really was. Um, and to understand him, you've got to understand this guy. This is Gus Washington, his dad. His real name was Augustine, but everyone called him Gus. Um, Gus was a big guy. This is a painting done after his death. Um, he was known for being sort of stooped and quiet. He was very entrepreneurial. Now, earlier we talked about the cherry tree story, and this is either a smart or cynical crowd, but you did not believe the cherry tree story was true and you were right. 
Um, this is an etching done 100 years at the centennial of America um, with the cherry tree story. It is a complete lie. Okay, It's a complete lie on a whole bunch of reasons. One, it never happened. It was made up by a guy named Parson Weems after George's death. Second, it's really wrong for two reasons. One, it creates a, uh, an impression of familial bliss, a, uh, an impression of a happy family life that George never had. Um, and finally, uh, it implies a relationship with his father that he never had. George's dad died when he was only 11. George did not know him very well. His dad traveled all the time. Um, he wasn't a bad dad. He was just busy and gone. And to his mother. Um, now, a lot of presidents get pushed along by their moms, right? You know, Bill Clinton, Roosevelt, right? Supportive mothers. George got pushed a different way. Um, George's mother was an awful person. Now, you go, wow, how do you know that, Steve? How do you, can you say that she was an awful person? That's a terrible thing to say. I'll give you two examples. One, she refused to go to his wedding, and she never went to his inauguration, and she could have. During the war, she wrote a letter to Congress asking for more money for herself, even though George had her in a house with servants. She just wrote it to complain and embarrass him. She was awful. So he did not have a happy home life. And in fact, he spent most of his life trying to get away from her. Okay, and that incentive to get away from her is what I think in many ways propelled him to success. His real father was this guy. This is Lawrence Washington. George's dad had two wives. His first wife died in childbirth, and she had had two sons, the oldest of which was Lawrence Washington. So this is George's half-brother. When his first wife died, he immediately remarried, and George is the oldest in the second family of six kids. Lawrence is 14 years older than him. Lawrence is appropriate here, dressed in a British military uniform. He fought for the British in a colonial war called the War of Jenkins' Ear. I kid you not. Um, and he really became George's surrogate father. By the way, uh, Lawrence inherited some property from his father called Eppenwassen. Um, when he returned from the war, he decided to name it after an admiral that he served under named Edward Vernon. And it was renamed Mount Vernon. And in fact, at Mount Vernon today, if you go, that picture is in there in his George's study. And George said during his lifetime, if Mount Vernon caught on fire, this would be the only thing he'd take. Um, unfortunately, Lawrence died young um, of tuberculosis. And George spent most of his life trying to emulate Lawrence. Now, um, George will spend his whole life being against inherited wealth, inherited position. He believed in meritocracy, he believed in the worthy of a hardworking man, and yet George inherited Lawrence's major commission in the Virginia military and would never in his life have a position below major. Um, and you, if you know George, which I do, that is not a contradiction in his mind. So anyway, unfortunately Lawrence dies, um, or fortunately, I guess it depends on how you look at history. Um, so here's what's happening. Um, OK, so kind of where I, my fist is here, this is modern day Washington, DC, Williamsburg area. OK, we're going up to the northwest, and there's Lake Erie up on the top. So this is about 300 miles. OK, in the middle is where the Allegheny and the Ohio rivers meet, sometimes known as Three Rivers. I don't want to surprise you here, but there's a war that's going to start between us and the French shortly. And um, the French decide that's a really good place to build a fort. Um, they call it Fort Duchesne. Um, we win the war. Um, we, rename it, we rename it Fort Pitt after the then Prime Minister William Pitt, and it becomes Pittsburgh. Okay? So Washington, D.C., Pittsburgh about halfway, and Lake Erie. Now what the French are doing is here's the Alleghenies, okay? and here's the colonies, obviously. And we're the good guys. We're moving west. Okay? And the French have built a series of forts through uh, the Great Lakes, down the Great Rivers, the Mississippi, the Ohio, all the way down to the New Orleans. And they're going to call this area west of the Alleghenies New France. And they don't want us moving west. So in 1754, remember this is 20 years before the Revolution, George is like 22 years old. And they need some knucklehead to lead a crazy group of guys over the mountains in the winter to go all the way up to this place on, called Fort LaBeouf on the edge of Lake Erie and give a, a diplomatic mission, mission to the French and say, essentially, get out. We're coming west. George raises his hand, right? I mean, come on, I get off the farm with mom. I'm out. So, so George, George leads this intrepid band of about 20 guys over the mountains. It's an incredibly exciting story. In fact, if you go on your tables, there's uh, my bookmarks, which you're all welcome to have. That's a painting done of 1840 of young Washington crossing the Allegheny. He's being chased by Indians at the time. Moments later, he falls in the Allegheny. He almost freezes to death. He gets back. Oh, by the way, he delivers the mission. I don't want to surprise you, but they say, no, we're not leaving. 
Um, he gets home, he writes up a journal, it becomes tremendously popular on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, he becomes kind of a minor celebrity. Um, and so they promote him to lieutenant colonel. He's now 22. He's number two in the entire Virginia military at 22. Now the, the Americans, the, the Virginians, are very convinced that the French, or the French horde is going to come down this. In, this is not a road. These are rugged paths through the woods. But they're going to come down, and they're going to attack the, the Virginians. So they send the intrepid young Washington off with 159 guys. And they move up to meet what they see as the French horde coming. And they run into this guy, Joseph de Cones of Jumonville. Jumonville is appropriately dressed here. He is a diplomat. He's carrying with him a diplomatic message that says essentially what George's did. Hey, we're not leaving. Stay where you are. Okay. Um, now, what I would like to tell you, and he's got 50 guys with him, a little bit bigger than George's party, but not much. And he says, what I'd like to tell you is that when George and his soldiers and Indian allies met Jumanfi, they met him with all diplomatic courtesy and escorted him back to uh, Williamsburg as George was escorted up to Fort LaBeouf. Instead, they met at this place, ominously called the Jumanville Glen. Um, in the early morning, George and his Indian allies sur surrounded the French. We don't know who fired first, but it doesn't matter. George and his men basically slaughtered the French. Um, now, a lot of people will say George fought in the French and Indian War. What happens is a Indian chief, without George's permission, grabs Jumanville by the head, takes a hatchet, knocks off the top of his head, and pulls his brain out. George caused the French and Indian War. It was his fault. <laughs> um, now, remember the also cherry tree story, not really True, which you guys all, yeah, you're all very smart. Not true. It's also not true because George could tell a lie. Um, you're you're going to sense that I like George a lot, but he did not want to go back to the farm. Okay, if he told the truth, he would have gone back to the farm. So what does he do? He says, "Oh, these guys are spies. I caught them sneaking in. I saved Virginia, and Virginia basically wants to believe him. So they send him back out again. Now he's got more guys." And he's going to, this is what George looked like, by the way, at the time. Um, I love this painting. I could spend my entire a lot of time talking about this painting because it's great. This is the first painting ever done by Washington, of Washington. It's by a guy named Peel, who did a number of paintings throughout his life. But you can see it's got the British soldier red, OK? It's got the blue here, which is a little hard to see. He's actually got a rifle over his shoulder to show he's a leader from the front, which he was. Um, the gorget around his neck shows he's a colonial officer. But, the 18th century, 1700s, guy paradise. Okay, why? First of all, he did not have a gut. He had that painted on. Okay, a little bit of a gut, sign of prosperity. Also, he had a full head of hair at this point, but he painted without the hair because baldness, sign of intelligence. So um, this was painted afterwards, but this is pretty much what he looked like. So he leads these guys out into the bush. Now, the French are coming. Right? Um, he's just killed a diplomatic officer. And unfortunately for George, and sort of a twist of bad luck, the half brother of Jumanville is back at Fort LaBeouf, and he is a Marine colonel, and he's the real deal. So he leads 500 French and Indian soldiers back down this road, which isn't really a road, it's more of a path. And George decides, I'm going to build a fort. He's going to call it Fort Necessity, because it's a necessity for build this, to build this fort. And Keep in mind, no experience. So he, first of all, builds it on low ground next to a swamp. So he has no line of retreat. He builds it with, uh, but it, with an easy firing distance of the nearby hills. So if you're in the hills, you can be behind the trees and fire down on the fort. <laughs> he digs trenches outside the fort, but he only makes them about hip high. So you can't actually get down in the trench, but you can't move either. So you're a good target for people in the trench. And finally, he builds really high walls so that all you can do is go inside and not be able to shoot out. But if you come out, you get shot. Yep. Now, um, <laughs> needless to say, he lost. He lost on, by the way, July 4, 1754. George did not like July 4th as a date until then, until later. And, um, and he certainly never celebrated it. All joking aside, there's a saying that Washington's early military education was paid in other men's blood. And that's really true. Um, what I will say in his defense is, A, he knew nothing at the time, and B, 
he never, almost never made the same mistake again. He would never build a fort, anything like this again, except for arguably the Brooklyn Heights during the Revolution. He would rarely ever get his guys to be this hemmed in. So he loses. His star has fallen. But by the way, George, remember, I can't tell a lie. He goes back and says, you know, I just want you to know, I only had like 200 guys. We stopped 500 French from coming down. I'm a, I'm a huge victor here again. Um, they don't buy this quite as much. But oh, by the way, this is what Fort Necessity looked like from the outside with these high walls. The British decide, look, we got we to gotta win this part of the war. There's really three theaters of war going on in the French and Indian War. It ultimately ends with the Battle of Quebec. But they've got to win the middle part here and take Fort Duchesne. So they send this guy, General Braddock. General Braddock is a fifth generation military officer. He's fought in lowland Europe. He's a classically trained military officer. And he is deployed with then the largest force of, of British soldiers deployed in America with a heavy artillery train. George, by the way, serves, oh, by the way, I love this. This is the, there are several paintings of Braddock. This is him looking his best. Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the idea is, and George wants to learn. So George be becomes part of his staff and really begins to learn what it is like to run an army. This is his real first military education. And Braddock's idea is pretty simple. I'm going to build a road. I'm going to take a whole bunch of guys with artillery. I'm going to come right up to Fort Touche, and I'm going to blast it. It's a pretty straightforward plan. The French, however, recognize that they're in big trouble. This is, they're only five miles now from Fort Duchesne. And the French, quite bravely, smash into the front of the British line, which is spread out, by the way, about two miles. So this is about two miles long. And George is in the middle with General Braddock. They hit the front, and then they start enveloping the British in very heavy woods. Okay? And they start getting behind trees and firing at these guys dressed in all red. By the way, George kind of makes a mental note. You know, in red, if in the woods, maybe I should be the other guys. So anyway, it is the worst defeat in British, one of the worst defeats in British history up to that point. Every officer there is either shot or killed, except George Washington. George has multiple bullets through his hat and coat. He fights with amazing bravery. This is a painting done afterwards that shows there is the moment when General Braddock, by the way, is getting shot. You can see the evil French and Indians. The French, by the way, are also, by the way, later are allies, but that's not quibble. Um, the, the French soldiers are also dressed in buckskin and moccasins. And there is the brave George Washington right at his side. We saw the uniform earlier. George leads a very controlled retreat, stops it from being a total rout, really saves the army. And he is then known as the hero of the Monongahela, which, by the way, he'll be known as until the Revolution. Um, a word starts getting used about George from this point on that will be used for the rest of his life. It's providence. It's a word we don't use much anymore. Um, providence really meant the will of God, destiny. Um, Samuel Davies was one of the leading preachers of the time, and his articles would show up in every newspaper in the country. And he wrote, may I point out to the public that heroic youth, Colonel Washington, who I cannot but hope providence has hitherto preserved until a single manner for some important service to his country. Um, James Crank is his doctor, and he will be with him at every major event of his life, including his death. Um, his duty and station expose him to every danger, but nothing but the superintending care of Providence could have saved him from the fate all around him. So he is now George Washington action hero, right? I mean, there's my story. He really is. And, um, but doesn't an action hero need a damsel in distress? I mean, I think so. Um, this is her. She was not in any distress. Um, this is Sally Fairfax. If you've been to Virginia and the areas. This is the Fairfaxes, as in like Fairfax County, Virginia, Fairfaxes. She is uh, part of that family. Um, I really like George. And this is before Martha, as I'll talk about. This does not make it OK. She's a married woman. Um, all historians agree he loved her, everyone. Most historians agree she loves him. Now, my book's a little different because I love historical fiction because I like putting some meat on the bones of the story. But I like to know where what's real and what's not. So in the back of my book, I included really extensive author notes to say what's true or not. Did he lie after the Battle of Fort Necessity or not? Did he have an affair with Sally Fairfax or not? Um, the answer to that is we'll never know. However, it is historical fiction, and I get to write it. So he did. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, but Sally isn't really the whole story, right? I mean, after Sally, he goes back, and they have not won the war. They still have not taken Fort Duchesne. So now they send this guy. This is General John Forbes. Now, I know he looks kind of like a pansy here, but he's not. 
Okay, he's the real deal. He's fought for the British all over the world and won in all kinds of different theaters. They send him with another army, and the first thing he does is summons Washington. And he says, hey, I heard you're brave. Tell me what your thoughts are. And he said, well, one, um, I don't really think we should be walking around in the woods in red. Um, how about if we wear brown? Um, when comfort and by the way, comfortable shoes, way more comfortable shoes. We also need a vanguard in front of us to be scouts to make sure nobody surprises us again. Oh, and we fight the, the French and Indians. Let's fight them in the woods and not do what General Braddock did, which was have them line up shoulder to shoulder and engage in the mass firing techniques that were famous for Lowland Europe. So he goes, good idea. You are the head of my vanguard. So George leads his vanguard. and. Forbes knows his business. They march right up to Fort Duchesne, and they win. Yay, we win. We will later win the French and Indian War when we take Fort Quebec. So in the meantime, Sally quite rightly says to George, it's not going to happen. There's an amazing letter that, she, uh, that he wrote to her that we have about that, um, that she kept. And he meets Martha Custis. This is, by the way, the first painting of Martha. We always see Martha in the funny hat, and she's old. This is Martha as a young woman. Martha was only 27 when they met. Her husband, Daniel Custis, had died of a heart attack, um, and she had two kids. She was the wealthiest widow in Virginia. Um, a lot of people will ask, um, you know, did he love Martha when he married her? And the short answer is no. Um, he liked her a lot. But at that time, you got married for sound reasons. In fact, George wrote a letter to a young woman much later in life where he said, Marry for sound reasons, Martha. Love will come, Martha. She was the most important person in his life. It was the most important relationship in his life. Um, don't marry for love only, Sally, right? So uh, Martha was tough, though. Um, she would not marry him until the war was over because he was stupid brave. So um, they win the war. Uh, he comes back. He marries her again. Mom doesn't come. Um, and he is now the hero of the French and Indian War. He's one of the most famous men in America. He's 20, at this point, 26, 27 years old. He's the second most famous man in America. Anyone want to guess who number one is? Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin is number one. But he's 27. He's number two. So you know that's pretty good. Um, in fact, on his 27th birthday, he gets in the House of Burgess, which is the legislature in Virginia. It's the longest running legislature. Um, thanks to the House be given to George Washington late colonel of the 1st Virginia Regiment for his faithful service, for his brave and steady behavior. So he is pretty famous. Um, but he figures he doesn't have that long to live, right? Dad died at 42, brother died at 36, grandfather died in his 30s, brother, great-grandfather died in his early 40s. The saying one was, no Washington man lives to see his 50th, few see their 40th year. Um, so he writes a letter to a friend a year later that says, I now I believed in fixed at this seat, Mount Vernon, with an agreeable consort for life, Martha, and I hope to find more happiness in retirement than I ever experienced amongst a wide and bustling world. And he's 28. Um, to his great surprise, um, he did not die. Um, in fact, at the Second Continental Congress on June 15, 1775, he shows up in this military uniform, this very one that he took out of mothballs. Now, a lot of people will tell you that George, oh, didn't seek the position. You know, all right, think of. We're about the size of that group at the Continental Congress here. And think of a guy that high walking around in that uniform. He's sending a message. He wanted to lead the Continental Congress. And wisely, they chose him. Because he had learned all the tools in the first war, how to lead an army in the field. And he would then, obviously, successfully. Um, so that's the story that almost no one knows. Now, let's answer those. Two questions. The other one, yes, you are a very smart group. You are not a single hand, by the way. That doesn't happen very often. OK. Wooden teeth. Everybody done eating? OK. It's not a good story. This is, wooden teeth is a better story than what it should be. Um, sometimes they were bone. Sometimes his own teeth would fall out. Um, and he would have them put back in the denture. The denture was a spring-loaded kind of metal. Um, so, and the reason he's painted with his mouth like this is because it was under pressure. If he didn't keep his mouth closed, it would pop open because they didn't have good adhesives like we have now. And finally, and most disturbingly, we can talk about slavery too if you'd like, um, but if he needed a tooth that he couldn't otherwise get, he would go to one of his enslaved people and have the tooth pulled and put in. He did give them equivalent of a dollar, but I don't think that makes it OK. So that's a bad story. I'm sorry, but you now know. The wig story is a different one. It was always his own hair. He never wore wigs. Now, I gave you a hint when I said it's like Guy Paradise in the 18th, 17th, 18th century. The reason is, is because remember, fat is good, 
bald is good, gray hair is good. So starting at a relatively young age, he would curl his hair and powder it gray, which is why I, too, powder my hair to make it look gray. <laughs> um, and because again, gray hair is a sign of intelligence. So that's, those, those are my questions with George. Um, I still have a couple minutes. I would love if there's any questions. By the way, I do have copies of my book here when we're done, if anybody wants a book. Um, are there any questions? You were going to ask me one about the research. Oh, well, I just asked I, I just asked you about um, how you did your research and what kind of research did you do to get this far. Yeah, the research thing we talked to Karen and I talked about it. She said we're going to talk about it. Is First of all, there are amazing biographies of Washington. He's, there are tons of biographies, and I use those a lot. But one of the really cool things is the University of Virginia um, has compiled every letter that George ever sent or received. Here, Karen, I'll give it to you some Jesper first. There, Karen, there you go. And they're really neat. There's 80 volumes, and it's all his letters. So you can read all his letters. Um, but there's a bunch of letters missing. Okay? And uh, they worked for 100 years to get them all together. But there's, we have every letter that George ever sent to Sally Fairfax, every one. She kept every single scrap of paper, even though they were loyalists. She went to England. They kept them. Virginia got them back. But we do not have most of Sally's letters to George, almost none. Why, Steve? Why do you say we don't have Sally's letters to George? Because when George died, Martha found them and burned them all. <laughs> um, so that is further evidence. So anyway. Um, I always want to stop early. I, oh, yeah, one more question. Where did the uh, never telling a lie story come from? A guy named Parson Weems. He invented a whole bunch of stories that he thought would be good for kids. Um, also, that George could throw a silver dollar across the Rappahannock, which by that time was over a mile wide. But he obviously lied. Right? Yeah, he did. Um, and he did. But it was a good story, and it caught, and Parson Weems' story captured the imagination at the time. So, you done? Thank you. So You're, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So in appreciation for your speaking presentation today, a donation to NPolio will be made in your name to, pen, to NPolio Now, which is the signature project of Rotary International. In the early 1980s, there were 400,000 cases of polio a year, um, and when Rotary decided to join with other organizations to lead the eradication of polio. We are so close to eradicating this devastating disease. We have had 10 cases this year in 2016, which is compared to 22 cases we had last year. So we're less than half of where we were last year. Success over polio will help fuel the energy of what people of the world can do when we work together. And here is a certificate for you in honor of your speaking cool. today. And here is a Rotary and Polio Now pin. Awesome. Thank you very Thank much. You so Thank much. you so much.